We've been sending creatures up into space for a long time, and tardigrades, among other microorganisms, are special in that they can withstand these extremes of temperatures, so they decided, well, let's see if they can withstand the real vacuum, and the perfect vacuum is in space. As we send tardigrades into space, the, the question has to arise, maybe tardigrades came from space if they can withstand it. I consider myself a naturalist. I've been called a naturalist in a classical sense, which, for example, and I'm not comparing myself, but Charles Darwin was a natura naturalist. He made a contribution to science. So basically, I'm just an ordinary person, and uh, I like nature, like most people do. And um, being in nature sort of wants to make me study it a little bit more. I, I wanted to make a contribution to science, modestly. I didn't think I'd do anything great, but something, maybe something that somebody hadn't done. And in just looking for various things to do, uh, the word tardigrade came up. Didn't even really know what a tardigrade was till I looked into it. So tardigrades are little microscopic creatures. They're about a millimeter or less in size. They're very tiny. Basically, it's a little caterpillar-like creature. It looks like a caterpillar with eight legs, and it has claws, which look like bear claws. That's why it's called a, a water bear. They have a mouth. They have a digestive tract. They have muscles. They have a nervous system. So they're similar to us in that way. Um, they're like insects in that they have that hard shell skin, which uh, they reproduce with eggs, um, and then they molt their skin, and they use their whole body to uh, facilitate digestion. We don't really know how they evolved. We can't even guess. We don't know what other species they're related to um, because they're so different. And of course, their ability to withstand, well, as far as heat, they can survive uh, 120 degrees Celsius, which is 240 degrees Fahrenheit, two or 300 degrees below zero, vacuum of space, a thousand atmospheres of pressure, x-rays, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, so the tardigrades can survive all of these extremes. Now, if you're looking for tardigrades and you want to find a good habitat, trees like this, which have deep furrows in the bark, are best. So tardigrades have gone into space where there is a perfect vacuum. And also there's a lot of um, solar radiation and ultraviolet and x-ray radiation in space. And it's very intense. It's something more than we can create here on Earth. So that was a great way to test them. And they came back and survived. Did tardigrades come from space? Anything is possible. We might have come from another galaxy. The problem is distances across space are so large. And even if you're traveling as fast as anything can travel, which is the speed of light, it would take hundreds, if not thousands of years to go from one galaxy or one planet to another. So in that time frame, anything can happen. You can't colonize planets that way. Not, not now, not as far as we know. So the answer right now is anything is possible. I don't have a personal theory about it. Do I believe in extraterrestrial life, that life exists outside this planet? Yeah, I do believe that. Just because I believe in odds and possibilities and because the universe is infinite, if you can just grasp that, which is hard enough to do. There might be other forms of life right under our nose, such as tardigrades, which are right here, which did come from other planets. We don't know that though. When I did a little research on it, I found out there wasn't really that much known about tardigrades. Um, and in fact, I read one scientific paper and found that uh, New Jersey, the state I was living in at the time, had zero tardigrades showing on the map. So I said, well, <clears throat> let's see if I could find a tardigrade. Visited all 21 counties in New Jersey and found that tardigrades are ubiquitous, which means they're everywhere. 
So I wrote a scientific paper, um, found various species, took photographs, identified the trees, their habitat, and that paper will be published soon. Um, it's being reviewed now by one of the prominent tardigradeologists and perhaps have even found a new species of tardigrade. Um, so that's under a review now. I've sent my slides off for analysis. Now, wait a second. This could also be a good tardigrade habitat. This is just ordinary moss. You just take a piece of moss out and place it into a, a coin envelope or a paper bag. And what you'll find is, even though it's dry right now, once you rehydrate it, tardigrades will appear. So we're going to place this moss into the envelope. How do tardigrades go into what's called cryptobiosis or suspended animation? I mean that's pretty fascinating. They just curl up into a little ball, they create a very hard shell, and somehow, some way within there's a seed of moisture, a molecule of water that preserves them inside this encrustment. The lifespan of a tardigrade, if it was just moving around in the water and you were observing it, might be, be only six months, but because it dries out, rehydrates, dries out, rehydrates, dries out, rehydrates. This could be done over a period of many, many years. You know, this is how they, they preserve themselves. Sometimes they can be 100 years old that way. Now there's a wee little tardigrade for you. So what we want to do is actually get to look at them close up. We'll change this objective to a tighter, more powerful lens. Okay, now let's see close up how he looks. So when you're looking through the microscope and you're seeing this little tardigrade moving around in his environment, he's in the moment, he's in the now. He's not thinking about the future. He's not thinking about the past. All he's doing is living and enjoying the present moment. So if we can be more like that, I'm not saying let's be like tardigrades, but what I am saying is if we can learn acceptance, I think everybody will be a lot happier. And I know I've been a lot happier since I've accepted and embraced life as it is.